In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The word of God that we'll meditate on this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets... They will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in the 1990s, there was a fad among Christians to wear a bracelet with the letters imprinted on it, WWJD which, of course, stood for What Would Jesus Do? And this morning, I want to play off of those words and change it just a little bit and ask the question, not what would Jesus do, but WWJS, what would Jesus see? What would he see? What I mean is this. As we look around and we see things, we use the senses God has given us to take in information and make sense of it the best we can. But what would Jesus see? If he were looking at the same things, what would he see if he were looking at the same people that we see? The story that I just got done reading, it shows us that this is an important distinction, that things are not always as they appear. To see things as Jesus sees them is really to see things from God's perspective and not from our perspective. If you've ever said to yourself, you know, I want to grow in my faith, I want to become more mature in my faith, grow closer to God or something like that, maybe you've struggled at times to, to put your hands around what that actually looks like. What would it mean for you to grow or mature in your faith? And the best answer I ever heard came from a fellow pastor who put it this way. He said, it's to see things more and more as God sees them. To see things, in, in other words, as they really are. And how can we grow in this perspective? How can we see things as Jesus does? Well, his word, it reveals to us how God sees things. And why is this so important that we're spending time, taking time out of our lives to talk about it this morning? Well, Jesus' story makes it pretty clear that how you see things can make the difference between life and death. Just think of the story from this, this earthly perspective. Those two men, Lazarus and the rich man, how starkly different they were. Just by looking at them, using your senses to take it in. Look at the rich man, a man who seemed to have it all. Nice house, nice clothes. He probably never worried about where his next meal would come from. We might imagine he lived in the kind of house that when people went by it, they stopped and they gawked. And they peeked inside as much as they could. 
And they imagined how much better their life would be if they only could live like this rich man lived. But then there's Lazarus laying in the gutter in front of this rich man's house. And you wonder what the rich man thought when he saw Lazarus. You wonder if he tried not to look at him. Or if he asked the question, why doesn't Lazarus just go get a job? Or what did Lazarus do? What bad choices did he make that he ended up like this? We do know this for certain. The rich man, if he saw Lazarus at all, he never lifted a finger to help him. Not even so much as to bring him a loaf of bread or something. For all that Lazarus wants, we're told, would be to eat the table scraps that came from this rich man's house. And yet, not even this he was able to have. Of course, both men died. And and here in the story, Jesus rips off the veil so that we now see things as he sees them. From the earthly perspective, both men laid dead. And the rich man probably had a big funeral. A lot of people talking about how he would be missed and how good he was. But it was Lazarus that God sent his angels to. It was Lazarus that was taken to Abraham's side to heaven. And then we find out it was the rich man who ended up in hell. And we can be fairly certain that the reason the rich man had disregarded God's clear command to love your neighbor as yourself was because the rich man disregarded God altogether. If the parable ended here, I think we'd walk away saying, okay, so Jesus wants us not to put our hope in wealth or in riches, but in him. That the things of God, the heavenly things, are where our true riches come from. And that's true. But Jesus continued the story. He wants us to see even more how he sees things compared to how those of this earth see them. And isn't it interesting that even in hell where we might presume that someone finally gets it, clearly this rich man did not yet see clearly as he thought that Lazarus should come and and cool his tongue with a drop of water. And then when he found out that wasn't possible, he continued, Father Abraham, then send Lazarus back to my brother's house to warn them so they don't end up in a place like this. And Abraham told him, Well, they have Moses and they have the prophets. They have God's word. They have what we would call the Old Testament. That's all they need. But isn't it interesting that even in hell, the rich man thought he knew better. I think we can safely say that hell is full of people who think they still know better than God. Because the rich man went on, no, 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 it's not enough for them just to have God's word. But if if someone would come back from the dead, that would do it. Then they would repent. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. You know, the lesson is clear that from the earthly perspective, God's word seems like something that isn't all that important, something that isn't enough But it's all that we need. It's all that we need, not just enough. It is all we need for us to have eternal life. And those who reject it, ultimately reject reject what God offers through it. You know, some of Jesus' parables, they teach us how God's kingdom works. I think this parable teaches us to pray, that we need to pray, and we need to pray often. Lord, help me to see things as you see them. And whether you know it or not, this is a prayer that we are offering every time we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say those words, your kingdom come. We're asking God to give us faith in the eyes of faith to see things as they really are. Why is that such an important prayer? Why is that something that we have to continually pray as we go through this life? Couldn't we say that the struggle really comes down to this? Our earthly vision contradicts so often what God's word says and the perspective that he gives us. Just consider how this looks in three areas that Jesus' parable touches on. How our earthly vision, our earthly perspective 
differs from God's perspective when it comes to how we see our neighbors, when it comes to how we look at, at wealth, and when it comes to God's word. You know, there's no question what Jesus wants us to do when it comes to our neighbors, that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. And the Bible tells us that, that your neighbor is anyone with whom your life intersects, whether that's through relationships or through interactions. These are your neighbors. And we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. But are there, there some neighbors that you have who you've turned away from because perhaps they've hurt you in the past? Some people that you go around because you feel like you have nothing to gain from them. Isn't it easier to have neighbors that you're comfortable with than to have the neighbors that God has given you? Or are there people in your life that you simply would rather not see at all? The unborn? Those living in poverty? The most vulnerable among us? You can see why we need to offer this prayer. Why we need God's word to show us how it is that he would have us love our neighbors as ourselves And to see that these are the people that God has put into our lives so that we might show our love to them. That he would work through us to serve them with our hands and with his word. And so we need to pray, Lord, forgive me for the times where I have been blind to see my neighbors. The neighbors you've put in my life. And open my eyes to see them and to love them. And what about that perspective on wealth? This is a hard one. It's one that's hard to tackle. How does Jesus view money? Well, he views it as a tool. Just like a hammer is used to hit a nail, money has a purpose. The purpose is to serve your neighbor with it. And yet, what is the earthly perspective? What is the worldly perspective on wealth? Money is a tool, but the tool is used for what? For me, to get ahead to buy the things that would make me happy or make me secure. Isn't this why in our country we measure just about everything in terms of dollars and cents? What's the bottom line? Did we come out ahead? Even a career is often measured in how much you might make in that career. Success often defined by how rich you are in terms of money. And the danger, of course, is this, that that if you have this perspective, this worldly perspective of money, you might very well be as poor as that rich man was when it comes to true wealth, when it comes to faith. If those things stand in the way of pursuing true riches in Christ, if those things have become the object of your love and of your worship. And so we need to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray here. Lord, forgive us for putting money in the place of you and for seeking money where our hearts should be seeking you. And finally, when it it comes to his word, this parable drives it very, drives it home that from an earthly perspective, God's word seems, seems unimportant and not enough. Again, the rich man was sure that it would not be enough for his brothers to open the Bible and to read it. They needed more. They needed a resurrection. And Abraham, in no uncertain terms, says, No. If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, then not even a resurrection will be enough. You know, if you really took Abraham's words to heart, you would say, Wow, God's word is so important. It is so precious that we would stop at nothing to hear it and learn it and take it to heart. And yet, is that what we see in our own lives? Martin Luther was certainly onto something in his explanation of the third commandment. You sh- when he, when um, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, and he said, "You should fear and love God, that you do not despise preaching and His word." We might have expected Luther to put the word neglect to neglect preaching, to neglect time in God's word. But he used the word despise because that word points to our hearts, 
To despise something means to look down on it, to treat it as something unimportant, as something that's not worth your time. And long before someone neglects God's word, long before they give up going to church or opening their Bibles, they have already despised his word. They've treated it as something unimportant. And could there be something more foolish than that? More foolish than than despising the very thing that God gives us so that we would have life through it and through him. And it's not just a matter of, of doing something that would benefit you in this world. No, Jesus says it is the difference between being like that rich man and going to hell or being like Lazarus and being brought to Abraham's side. Of course, the irony here was that the rich man was sure that if there was a resurrection, if, if Lazarus only came back from the dead, then his brothers would believe. And yet, in Abraham's response, there's also some irony. That a resurrection would not be enough, Abraham said. And those words are directed at Jesus' own enemies who themselves would reject the resurrection of Jesus as the ultimate proof of all that God's word says and proclaims. Praise God. Praise God that we have been given eyes to see, the eyes of faith. Praise God that he has opened our eyes to see the treasures of God's word, to see things as they truly are. You know, on our best days, when our eyes are clearest, that's also when we see sin at its ugliest. Our sins as they really are. Our foolishness for what it is. Not just bad choices, but that which deserves hell itself. But then we also see God's goodness to us in Jesus. His grace for us as it truly is that God would send his son to rescue us by his own life and by his death. And ask the question, what would Jesus see if he looked at you? What would he see? What he would see is this, not your sin or your foolishness. He would see a brother or a sister. He would see you covered by his righteousness, his perfection. He would see an heir of eternal life. What would Jesus see? It's a good question to ask yourself, to examine yourself, just like when you go to the eye doctor, you might mistake the D for the B. We don't always see things as clearly as we might think we do in this life. And yet, we praise God that he gives us his word, that we might see things as they are. When St. Paul talked about seeing clearly he said that in this life, we're never going to have perfect vision. It's never going to be 2020. We'll never see them as they exactly are because of our sinful flesh. But when God sees it as his perfect time to take you home, he'll send his angels as he did to, to Lazarus and bring you to Abraham's side. And the first thing when you open your eyes that you're going to realize is this. Now I see things as they are. Now I see things clearly with 2020 vision, now I see him, Jesus, face to face. Amen. Please stand. We'll confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, you have graciously given us, your children adopted by grace, the gift of faith. Remove from us all wayward boasting and any inclination toward self-righteousness. Increase our faith in the holy gospel, which is your power for the salvation of all who believe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Look with mercy, especially upon those who have requested our prayers, that they may ever cling to Jesus as their sure and certain hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend these and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.